I'd like to introduce the Professor of Public Health at University of Otago, Dr Michael Baker. Yeah, tēnā koutou katoa. Um, look, it's a great honour to be speaking at your meeting. And of course, like all of the speakers, I'm disappointed not to be looking out at a sea of faces. And one of the things I would ask right at the beginning would have been for a show of hands as to how many of you uh, have been impacted by this pandemic. Because I know the nursing workforce is right at the forefront of all components of the New Zealand response. And it is remarkable, as we've heard, just how much this year has altered, I think, our social perception of the, the health workforce and how critical it is. Um, and there's many lessons from that. So, uh, and I think the theme for your um, meeting is really appropriate um, and thinking about 2020 and beyond, because this is obviously a key year in redefining the role of the health system and key health, frontline health workers in protecting society. So I'm going to talk about the New Zealand elimination approach. Um, we're still the only country, I think, in the world that actually has a published elimination strategy. And uh, there's huge global interest, not only within New Zealand, but of course internationally, in how this strategy is working and how we can sustain it. So um, in terms of my own background, uh, I am uh, work at the University of Otago Wellington, which is, as some of you know, is a clinical school um, with the main campus, of course, down in Dunedin. And I've been around long enough to have seen a few um, pandemics. And actually, the thing that got me really interested in public health was in the late 80s, um, stepping out of clinical medicine for what I thought would be a year, to have a year in Wellington, working for one of the ministers of health. And I got the job of looking at HIV AIDS, the response. And a big gap at that stage was for protecting injecting drug users. So. I went off and set up the, the National Needle Exchange Program. And I think it may have been the first national program in the world. And it gave me this, um, a real interest in the idea of what progressive governments could do to protect the public if they acted um, in a proactive way. And uh, like some of you um, would have been um, slightly involved in the SARS response, which fortunately didn't require a major response. And of course the pandemic influenza in 2009 and like everyone, I think, in the health services being affected by COVID-19. So today I want to talk briefly about um, these topics. Um, I mean, how do we assess the pandemic and decide what to do? What are those, the choices we've got? And sometimes we talk about the least bad choice. Uh, the New Zealand elimination strategy, um, how is it working? And what are the big lessons we can take forward from this? So, Looking at, and I've done a lot of thinking about pandemics over the last few years, and I would say these are five recurring themes um, that I've picked up on. They often have high impact. Um, they generally increase inequalities, in fact, almost invariably. Um, there's always this uncertainty and unpredictability about them, particularly at the beginning. They're generally very controllable um, and they will create panic and outrage at different points. And we're always seeing that. So just to remind you of the basic term, the, the core idea is an epidemic, which is more than you expect. And so outbreaks are a subset of that. They are, um, if you like, um, epidemics that are very localized in time and place. And fortunately, only a tiny portion of them progress to being pandemics which are obviously widespread, affecting many or all countries on Earth. And of course, if this was to scale, this would be a tiny pinpoint here because pandemics fortunately don't happen very often. So this is a very busy slide, but it's um, what I'm trying to point out here is that if you like, there's a typology of pandemics and it's why we need to learn as much as possible about these events so we can respond better in future. The, the events that have redefined really pandemics are really influenza pandemics, and particularly 1918, of course. Um, but um, you've got um, the pandemics, which are diseases with short median incubations that are transmitted widely, and influenza we're familiar with. We're less familiar, but we're getting more familiar now with the coronaviruses, now that we've seen our third pandemic, um, if you like, related to these viruses. 
the big threat on the horizon are these synthetic or weaponized infectious diseases um, as bioterrorist agents. For example, smallpox could be liberated into the world again, and this would be a, um, a terrible threat globally. Um, I've mentioned here public health emergencies of international concern. This is events that the World Health Organization designates as having important significance. And you can see there are things down here like um, polio and um, Ebola, which while not um, necessarily a huge threat to New Zealand, um, still are um, uh, important. You've got um, infectious diseases that are predominantly asymptomatic. And it's interesting to think about how the HIV AIDS pandemic would be managed today. And we do have the potential for, if you like, um, antimicrobial resistant pandemics. Um, and of course, we have now other things that are particularly vector-borne diseases, and Zika was also declared a public health emergency of international concern. So I'm just saying, I'm just putting this up to point out that there's this, a range of pandemic threats that we need to think about. So again, sorry, another busy slide, but this is saying that when we assess pandemics, there's lots of factors we need to look at. Um, the health impact, how transmissible they are, controllable, what sort of information do we have on them? What's the feasibility of responding? The economics, and this is still a big debate, of the cost of action and inaction. And fortunately in New Zealand, um, inequalities is very much on the agenda as it should be. So looking at some of these um, factors in more detail, one of the first things you do when you're confronted with a pandemic is you try and work out how dangerous will it be based on what you know. And in uh, February, we did the modeling for the Ministry of Health to say what would be the likely impact of COVID-19 if it got arrived in New Zealand and was widely um, transmitted here. And this basically showed that um, around 0.3% of the population would die from this based on uh, some degree of control. And this is not a bad flu, this is 25 times worse in terms of population impact. So if you stacked, I mean, we typically get around 500 people dying every year from seasonal influenza. So you'd have to stack 25 years on top of each other to get to the likely impact of COVID-19 in New Zealand. So going back to that, the, the other factor, the impact on inequalities, this is showing a century here of the um, impact or the mortality risk from uh, pandemic influenza. So we've got three of these events. And you can see despite um, improvements in New Zealand, even in the most recent pandemic, it was still significantly more lethal for Maori compared with European and other New Zealanders. So we would ex have expected exactly the same outcome for COVID-19 in New Zealand. So, um, probably uh, many of you will remember when you first became aware of um, COVID-19 and at what the point at which you said, this is really something to worry about. Um, and I sort of think myself of these light bulb moments when I suddenly thought, um, yes, it's going to be a global pandemic. And I think it was looking like it for January, but then there was this paper at the end of January in the Lancet saying it's spreading out of China um, and it looks like it's been it's going to be hard to control in other countries unless they take very rapid, vigorous measures. Um, the second light bulb moment for me, um, because I was thinking, yes, this will be like pandemic influenza, was this joint report from the World Health Organization, this mission to China in late February, and it said in Wuhan they stopped this pandemic in its tracks, which was pretty remarkable. And that, to me, said it can be contained and eliminated and it's more like a, a SARS virus than an influenza virus, and that turned out to be the case. And in March, mid-March, we could see it was becoming established in New Zealand. It was transitioning from uh, imported cases to community transmission, and so that suggested we needed, uh, we didn't have the capacity to stop it, we needed a lockdown. So this is the model we were working on, uh, the, the trusty New Zealand pandemic influenza plan, which aimed to flatten the curve. And this was the approach up to mid-March. And then New Zealand switched to elimination. And just to remind you, the, the idea of elimination has been around for, for three decades or more. Um, 
we always try and control serious diseases, um, try and keep the, the incidence down. Um, um, I, I think my video might have frozen. Um, Hi, Michael. The technicians are asking if you can um, turn your webcam off and then on again. Okay. Have you got me connected? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Can you see me again? We can't see you, but people are saying they can still hear you. Okay. Um, yeah, and we can see your screen. We just can't see your video. Oh, yeah. Is that clicked on again? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. Um, right, so um, we're just talking about these um, strategic choices for countries and um, so uh, we have this, this um, pattern uh, or these options of control elimination that have been around for um, uh, uh, more than 30 years. And um, uh, the idea of elimination is obviously a higher bar that you actually completely interrupt transmission and eradication really is, is stopping transmission at the global level is a much tougher to achieve. Um, and really we've got smallpox as the, the one example so far. So, so when countries are confronted by these choices, um, you have, um, Traditionally, mitigation is for flu, but um, uh, this, the option of elimination was um, what New Zealand decided was possible. And of course, you've also got exclusion, which is what some Pacific Islands are doing successfully. And the big benefit of that is that you can return to hopefully a new normal within a few months. And this is a pattern being seen in Asian countries, which have largely eliminated this uh, uh, pandemic and uh, their economies are thriving and you look at mainland China and Taiwan and to some extent Vietnam and uh, Thailand, Cambodia. Um, so that seems to be a very successful model and that's certainly the, the approach New Zealand's pursuing. So we, we wrote up the um, elimination strategy and published this and this was really adopted by New Zealand effectively on the 23rd of March when the Prime Minister did the famous um, presentation to New Zealand and um, uh, said how um, we were going to go to um, uh, rapidly to this level four lockdown. And um, that's what we did. So um, with the elimination strategy, um, a lot of it is around um, uh, trying to um, push down this reproduction number. And we've all heard a lot about this and this is the, the number of secondary cases that are generated by each case. And if that's below one, you effectively are stamping out the um, virus. And we have limited tools for, for, for doing this. Um, and uh, we unfortunately can't reduce the duration of infection, but we can reduce transmissibility and contact rates. 
So this is really what all the control measures are trying to achieve. So we're familiar with um, uh, these, these major elements. So that's the keep it out at the borders, damp it out with um, testing and contact tracing and reducing transmission. And this is particularly where um, hygiene measures and physical distancing and so on come in. So um, this is one of the, uh, um, uh, you know, a lot obviously was done at the borders, but this is showing um, the quite remarkable reduction in travel numbers. And there were some days in this period when no one came or left from New Zealand, um, which uh, people had to look back in the, really for historic records for decades to see similar um, examples of that. We also had a huge increase, obviously, in uh, testing and contact tracing. And by um, the recent, with, during the recent um, resurgence, we had uh, testing up to around 25,000 a day, which is a real tribute to the laboratory scientists in New Zealand. We're all familiar with the, the lockdown levels, and I think this was a, um, or alert level system. I think this is a real triumph of risk communication um, and that we all started to understand in New Zealand. And I think that was, uh, it was actually adapted from an approach in Singapore, but I think it worked extremely well here. So what was the consequence of this um, lockdown? And this is the, the stringency index, which is available for over 150 countries. Um, it's put out by Oxford University. And what this showed was that New Zealand had the most stringent lockdown internationally of any country. And we had this, of course, for four weeks and then another uh, three weeks, roughly, at level three, and then drop down to um, fairly rapidly back to level one. Uh, so it was a total of about two months and of constraints. And there are so many of you who have seen amazing images um, wherever you live in New Zealand. This was um, uh, Russia and Wellington at this point at level four. And these are scenes we may never see again in our lives. So, what did this achieve? Well, this was, um, uh, we published a summary of the New Zealand response and the epidemic curve um, in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this was showing these bands of control measures at the borders, community transmission, case-based measures, and also additional communication and uh, economic support, and how these, these controls were all phased in and, and phased out at different points, and successfully um, eliminated this virus from New Zealand. In terms of the impact of this approach, this is looking at um, the, the mortality impact, and that's deaths per million. And New Zealand is the, has by far the lowest mortality in the OECD, and it's more than 100 times less than uh, countries in Europe like Sweden, where some people said we should follow the Swedish model, the Plan B group said that. Um, they subsequently changed to saying we should follow Australia and then Iceland. But overall, using this crude measure, New Zealand performed extremely well. That's just mortality. One of the other measures, and sorry, there's a, it's a bit hard to look at this graph, but what this was showing is that we, we also saw a decline in all-cause mortality. And this actually dropped um, uh, by um, uh, 5%, a very significant drop. And so this is continuing, and I think by the end of the year, uh, we'd see roughly 1,500 fewer deaths than we would typically see. And that's particularly fewer deaths from influenza. The winter, excess winter mortality appears to have gone. So um, that's, um, I guess, reassuring. And there hasn't been any increase in suicide um, at this point. So um, some of the anticipated potential negative effects of the um, elimination had not been seen. So one of the other measures is looking at economic impacts of the, of the um, elimination approach. And this is using just one measure, um, and that's um, payroll um, job estimates. And New Zealand, again, uh, appeared to bounce back very rapidly after the pandemic, uh, after the first outbreak, and performing better than Australia, for instance, which had ongoing transmission. So a feature of um, elimination, of course, is you have to plan for resurgences, as we're seeing at the moment. And as we know, after three months of no transmission, 
we saw this outbreak in Auckland, which we're still experiencing. And the, the response now, of course, is different. It's much more targeted, with much more testing, contact tracing. And also we've added now uh, mass masking in public transport and other settings. Uh, so the hope is that this approach means, and it already has meant less time using um, uh, lockdowns, and that was certainly only two weeks in Auckland at level three. So hopefully it's a way of the future we can identify and stamp out outbreaks very quickly, and at the same time reduce the chance of having them. So what are some of the key lessons about sustaining this response? Um, these are, these are um, some ideas we put out in a piece in the conversation, which is, um, I don't know if, if many of you um, look at this, this is a free um, academic um, uh, blog post that uh, you can sign on for, and I'd really recommend it if you're not getting it at the moment. There are, there's an Australasian edition and, and many other editions, but they have lots of um, discussion about, uh, or, or comments from academics um, across the world. But these are some of the ideas we put out in this recent conversation article about um, improving our, our response. And one of them is to really build up our national public health infrastructure. And this is something we've talked about before, about the need for a public health agency in New Zealand. So um, again, a lot of details here, but I think one of the messages from this elimination response is that it can be applied to many other infectious diseases. And we've got pandemic diseases, we've got diseases where eradication's already happened, but there's others where eradication is underway at a global level. And we also have regional elimination approaches. And many of you will be familiar with the approaches to measles and rubella. But there are other diseases where we're on the cusp of uh, eliminating them. We don't have formal elimination strategies for them, but these are all conceivable with the, um, the, t the methods we have available at present. So I think we'll hear a lot more about elimination in the future. So one of the other really big lessons, well, I, th I think for me, um, one of them is that effective science and good political leadership is really um, a, a vital resource for countries. And you look at countries succeeding and those that are failing um, in their response to the pandemic. And so this is, uh, I think, a huge lesson for the future. I think there are other lessons about our institutional arrangements in New Zealand. Elimination does benefit health and the economy compared with alternatives. This idea of assessing risks and, and acting very decisively um, has been imp very important in New Zealand, and I think it applies to other crises. Uh, we need to consider equity and partnerships. They're vital, and you can look at how critical they are in Auckland at the moment, for example, engaging with communities to drive the response there. We need to strengthen our public health infrastructure. Um, we need more public health nurses. We need to have career paths that make this a very attractive um, choice and really to increase training um, and, and career development for, for this critical branch of our workforce. And we, I think at a global level, really need to reform our global health agencies like the World Health Organization. But for me, one of the big lessons is around this broad reset and inc an increasing focus on um, managing uh, these major global health threats. And many commentators have pointed out that uh, climate change um, will not only be a more severe threat, but it's also one that's locked in for um, generations because you can't take that CO2 out of the atmosphere once it's put in there. And so that these, this will have long-term consequences. We really need to act now and we need to listen to the scientists. So just in summary, um, I don't need to tell you that pandemics are characterized by impact inequalities, uncertainty, controllability if you act rapidly and some degree of panic and outrage the New Zealand elimination strategy is what we describe as the least bad choice based on all the metrics we have available. It's an opportunity to strengthen public health capacity to create a more equitable and sustainable society. And I think your theme is very appropriate about nursing 2020 and beyond. And just wanted to acknowledge I've got many collaborators, particularly Mandy Carlsberg and Nick Wilson who've assisted me We've got a group co-search which is working on this and supported by a number of funders. And I think it's great to find 
finally find a use from the uh, or benefit from the flag referendum. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much, Michael. We do have one question that's come through uh, the line, if it's okay if I read it out for you to um, see if you can comment. So the question is, what is your opinion on the Director General for Health statements on infected healthcare workers and the level of health worker exposure and the PP issues that have now been strengthened but are not at their best standards? Yes, well, look, um, I think it's absolutely critical to protect the, the health of our, um, uh, our health workers because uh, effective PPE is um, a matter of life and death for many people. And uh, um, we know that, um, and I talk to my immunology colleagues about this, and they, they do say that the, the inoculum that you're exposed to does affect your chance of getting infected. And when we look internationally, um, healthcare workers at it, who are younger and fitter uh, are still getting infected more commonly with this virus. And it does seem to be related to the, obviously the level of exposure and also the level of inoculum. So this is really vital um, that we protect this workforce. Um, it's interesting, we have to think broadly too, it's also people who, um, the cleaners in hospitals, and uh, also other frontline uh, workers, say bus drivers and so on. This is really in countries like the UK, which have um, a high degree of exposure, um, uh, are also more vulnerable. So I think this is a really important question. Mm. Thank you very much for that. I think your face has become such a familiar face every morning um, on the news and certainly allowing us to get, uh, understand the science behind the approach. I think that's been very critical and informing. And I think um, you raise the important um, aspects, the science and the political leadership that has helped us through this challenging time. And I think the communication that we've had as a country has also enhanced the way that we've taken responsibility collectively around um, moving forward. So I thank you very much for your time today and the opportunity for our members to hear the science uh, behind the strategies of elimination. Thank you very much.